Today, 1 Peter chapter 1, that will be where we will go in God's Word. Please join me. 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll look at verses 3 through verses 9. And um, we're, we're talking about our hope. Now, often when we think of the word hope, we use it like, I hope it's going to rain today so I don't have to water my lawn. Or we ask someone if they're a follower of Christ, and if they were to say, I hope so, well, then we better get to witnessing to them and helping them know for sure. So we often use it as an anemic word that's, that's like, well, maybe it'll be or maybe it will not be. It's kind of a wishful thinking. But when we see the word hope today in the context that Peter is using it, it's actually something that is guaranteed. It's genuine. It is going to happen. And we know it's going to happen, and we look to it to happen. And, and folks, that's what we have in the Lord, and that's what we're going to see. It's interesting as we read through the different um, writers of the New Testament, Paul's favorite word was uh, faith. He loved to talk about faith. Um, John loved to talk about love, and evidently Peter's word was hope. So that's what we're going to look at because we're living in a world where a lot of people do not have hope. Now we know if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then a lot of things that you may be putting your hope in, your faith in, things that you are loving, they're going to fall short of being what you need. But also, if we're not careful as followers of Christ, often we can forget the hope that we have. And so I'm going to be honest with you this morning as your pastor. The more I look at these verses in 1 Peter chapter 1, they're, they're, I mean, it's like I lack the words to explain them. So I've been praying all morning that the Holy Spirit would take it and it wouldn't just be something you already know, that, that it would really resonate in our hearts as we realize how much God loves us and what Jesus did for us on the cross and through our faith, the living hope that God has given us. And Peter's going to talk about trials. Here's a little background. When Peter is writing this letter, the emperor Nero is on the throne. And he hates Christians. And, and, and he spends his time trying to think of ways to torture and put Christians to death. So I, it's hard for us to have that mindset right now, although I feel like we're getting very close to those days, even here in our own land. But think about it. I mean, you're, you're, the, head, you're, you're, you're the father, the, the head of the household, and you're leading your family to love and to follow Christ, and all of a sudden you're arrested, and, and maybe you're martyred. You're put to death for that. And then you have, you know, your wife and your children are left behind. Um, it's just a very turbulent time, and, and I don't think we can truly appreciate what it meant to stand up for Christ. But I'm telling you, God gives you the ticket when you need it. And it amazes me, not only in the Word of God, but through Christian history, to look at the men and the women that stood up and endured things that we think, how is that possible? And they never renounced their faith. I'm telling you, this passage is going to teach us that because of our living hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has prepared for us, it gives us the strength to be a witness for him today. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I'm going to do my absolute best with the Holy Spirit's leading to expound upon this great text. And I want to go ahead and prepare you. I'm going to give you the end of the sermon. We're going to verse 9, but if you look in verse 8, it talks about an inexpressible joy. That's where we're headed, folks. When we think about who we are in Christ, it should give us an inexpressible, I mean, we do not have the words to thank God and to express what we have in Christ. And if we keep that in mind, then whether we're persecuted for our faith or we're just going through the trials of life, we have what we need to keep going. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, and I pray that these words will be your words. Father, I stumble over things like living hope, and, and Lord, over the, the praise and the honor and the glory that we are going to have, Lord, as we reign with Christ. Lord, I, I, and that we, we think about the inheritance, Lord, that you have prepared for us. How do we wrap our minds around those concepts? Lord, I pray today as we look at these few verses that, Lord, we will recognize that we do have a living hope. And in the midst of everything that's going on in our lives, Father, we can have joy. Lord, I pray that in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. 
And we know that persecution is beginning to rear its head, as I said earlier, here in our own homeland. As we take a stand for Christ, we're looked at as being narrow-minded. And, you know, all of the, the, if you would, the rules and regulations that's in the Word of God, why did God put that in there? Well, He created us. And he wants what is best for us. And so if he says adultery is not good for you, then it's not good for us. If he says murder is not good, then it's not good. If he says gossip is not good, then it's not good. If he says deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, then to do the opposite of that is not good. What is in the word of God, whether we agree with it or not, whether we understand it or not, if we will put our hope in the Lord and be obedient to it, then we realize we have a living hope. And so that is my prayer this morning. Now, probably everybody in here is going through something or you have been through something. I I find this all the time. I mean, I I find it not only with the people I pastor, but but many times there are people that will end up in my office that are not even in church. They're not in church anywhere. They, they may be a friend of some of yours, and you'll tell them, you know, you need to come talk to my pastor, and they will come. And, and it, it's amazing to see the, the burdens that people are, are carrying. And, and, and sometimes I'm sitting there, and the whole time I'm praying, Lord, just give them a glimpse of who you are. This life is always going to be difficult. God never promised for the believer that it would be easy. He never promised that we wouldn't shed tears. So I want to encourage you today, when we look at these verses, we can make it through those hard times when we know what God has for us. Remember, hope here is not some wishful thinking. It is something that has been promised, and it is coming. Let's unpack the text. Now, verse 1 and 2 or an introduction, and so I'm going to go immediately to verse 3 because there's so much in verse 3. Um, maybe I shouldn't say this, and I'm not saying anybody do this, but I was watching a, a pastor um, recently, and um, he had this, this huge, it looked like a huge iPhone. I mean, it was like life-size, and it had the Scripture on it, and as he was preaching, he had this little pen, and he was able to circle and underline. Man, I'd be dangerous with one of those. So I don't have all of that, and I probably wouldn't know how to use it, but I'm going to try my best to help you see verse 3. We're going to understand the English um, words, of course, but there is so much happening in verse 3 that if we don't grasp it, we're not going to understand any of the other verses that we're looking at. So First Peter chapter 1, look at verse 3. There, there's just so many things here, and I'm going to try to unpack it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter begins here just by praising God. The word blessed here, we get our word um, to eulogize. We think about that at a service where we speak well of someone or we uplift someone's name. Peter is reminding us that God needs to be praised. I have said this before, but we need to hear it this morning. I need to hear it. If God never does anything else for us, And I know for some of you, I'm unpacking something that you know very well. But if God never does anything else for us, he did enough giving us Jesus Christ. I mean, I think of those those verses that I learned. I, I, I knew these verses even before being in church because I learned them in vacation Bible school, not being raised in church. But I mean, how do we get away from verses like three Romans 3.23? I mentioned earlier that all of the Word of God is for our benefit. So what does Romans 3.23 remind us of? That we are all sinners, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and, and what does Romans 6.23 say, say? I mean, the first part of it is, is, is it should be concerning to us if we're not in Christ. It, it says, for the wages of sin is death. This doesn't mean that we just go out of existence. I mean, this means that there literally is a place that was not prepared for us. It's for the devil and his angels. But if we reject Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation and God taking the initiative to reveal that to us and we say no to the Holy Spirit, then the wages of our sin, because we're, we're, we're all Adam's race under him, under the curse, I mean, 
We're sinners. And the wages, the payday of that is death, separation from God. But what does the latter part of Romans 6, 23 tell us? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Or you could say through Christ Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Are you in Christ Jesus? You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. I didn't ask you if you were a faithful member of this church or any other church. I didn't ask you if you tithe. I didn't ask you if you use good words to your, your family and your neighbors. I, I didn't ask you if you help your neighbor when he's in need. All of those are good things, but you know what? You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. And the Word of God tells us that we're all sinners, and all the good that we want to do will never put us in Christ. We have to come to the point of saying, God, I am a sinner Thank you for sending your only wonderful son, Jesus, to shed his precious blood on that cross. His blood was payment for my sins and your sins and the sins of the world. We need to thank God for that. And the fact that Jesus resurrected on the third day is proof, it's evidence that God accepted that sacrifice. Jesus went to the cross for the sins of this world. We've heard that preached as Baptists all our lives. Why doesn't it excite us anymore? Do you realize we could be lost one breath away from hell, but God loved us so much that he sent Jesus, and Jesus died and resurrected for us. So what is Peter saying here? All of that being the backdrop, look, look at the wording. Since I don't have my fancy thing to write on, I'll use my fancy lines up here on the gym floor. All right, so the ultimate thing here, so God is to be pleased. He, he's the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ according to his abundant mercy. What is mercy? We're guilty sinners, and, 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 and we deserve judgment. We deserve punishment. We deserve to be eternally separated from God. But yet God loved us so much. And by the way, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, and, and well, Eve sinned, and then Adam willingly sinned and plunged the world into sin, God didn't scratch his head and say, man, I didn't see that coming. There was a genetic flaw somewhere. God knew if he acted in creation that he would have to act in our redemption. Oh, my goodness, God's mercy. What does it say? Not just mercy, but in, in the New King James here, it says abundant mercy. Abundant. We didn't get what we deserve. God demonstrated grace. And he said, I know they're ruined. I know they're broken. I know their thoughts are against me, but I love them. And I'm going to send my son. And if they'll place my son, their faith in my son, in his sacrificial work on the cross, then they'll be saved. Peter goes on to say not only abundant mercy, but, but what does he say here? That we're begotten. What does that mean? It means we have been born again. We have been reborn. Not physically, but spiritually. We've been given a new heart. Think about it before you knew Christ. Your neighbor may do something to upset you, and you'd be like, I'm going to get back at them. Or, or, or you might use words that you don't use anymore. Or, or, or maybe your hope and, and, and your sense of, of, of worth come out of, I'm going to be the top in my place of business. I'm going to exceed over everybody else. I'm going to be financially secure. Everyone is going to look up to me. Everyone is going to respect me. Maybe before Christ, your, your, your Sundays, you didn't care a thing about worshiping. You weren't a bad person probably, but you didn't care a thing about coming and giving praise to God. You just wanted to praise yourself for what you could accomplish. Now that was the clean version. Maybe you're here and your testimony is much, much different. Maybe your language was very profane. Maybe your thoughts, maybe you were caught up in things, pornography, maybe some addiction, alcohol, a drug. I, I, I don't know, whatever it is. Maybe you, you're like, Brother Robert, if you knew what I did in the past, you would look at me completely different. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. And I mean that with every fiber of my being because I have a past. 
There was once upon a time that I didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, when I said yes to Jesus, because, and that's why God is worthy to be praised. I mean, because of his mercy, he reached out. I didn't choose God. I didn't even want to go to church. But one day God began to work in my family and in my heart and, and through a process of things that I don't even fully understand. People were praying, people were doing. And, and, and one day I stumbled upon the church and as time went on, I gave my heart and life to Christ. And eventually God would call me to the ministry. I didn't plan any of that. Maybe you're here and you're very broken. But I'm going to tell you, when you're in Christ... You're covered under the blood. You're covered. All of that vileness. In your life, the sanctification process is a process. I mean, maybe the filthy language didn't stop just overnight. But I'm going to tell you, as, as someone being in Christ, when you said something ugly, your heart was pierced. And you're like, oh, I can't, I, I'm not going to dishonor my Lord that way. Or when you began to do something that you once, you know, didn't care and had no guilt about doing you know, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. And as you walk with Christ and grow closer to Christ, things change. You, you begin to want to read your Bible. You begin to want to pray. You want to worship God. You want to share about Jesus. Anybody watch any football yesterday? Did you get excited? Did your team win? Roll Tide? Anybody else's team? Sorry, happy you were going to tune the rest of the stuff out, I say. Did anybody get excited? I, I know some families that when their teams, husband and wives, when they're rooting for different teams and they're playing one another, they have to go to different areas of the house. I mean, it gets serious. Maybe that didn't, didn't relate to you. Did you ever get excited over your grandchildren? And what they do, I don't have grandchildren yet, but I get exciting, excited over my, my child, over Lillian. I can't share the funny things she says anymore. I will say this, it was funny. I was complaining the other day. Uh, yeah, I'm human. Not in a bad way. I'd misplaced something, and since we've moved, nothing is where it should be. And I couldn't find it. And so I was like, where is it? I can't believe I can't remember. And I still hadn't found it. And Lillian came in the room, and she'd got this from one of her Disney movies, I'm sure. And she said, let me think about how she said it. Chin up, princess. Your crown's going to slip. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> and I just busted out laughing, and so did she. So we get excited about our grandchildren and our children. We get excited when our finances are in order. We get excited when something good happens in our life. Well, my dear friend, God loves us. Even when we curse, even when our eyes looked at things they shouldn't look at, even when our hands did things they should not do, God loved us and said, no, I want this one redeemed. And, 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 and he wooed us, and we had the opportunity to ask Jesus into our life. That's something to get excited about. Amen. But no, I can't talk about religion. That'll offend somebody. Well, you can talk about your grandchildren. Couldn't that offend somebody? Well, no, religion is a hot topic. It's like politics. Well, I'd rather offend somebody and maybe God will use it to bring them to faith than they wake up in hell one day. So the scripture goes on. His abundant mercy. Oh, it's abundant. What else does verse 3 say? We have a living hope. Remember, hope here is not wishful thinking. What is a living hope? Your translation may say a lively hope. It is a hope that is on fire. It is a hope that's like, it is coming. It's going to be here any day. I'm looking into the sky waiting for Jesus to come back. And, and, and it's changing the way I do everything in my life. That's what a living hope is. Now let's read it one more time. And we'll put these concepts together because if we don't grasp this, none of the other verses will matter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You put it all together. 
God loved us so much. We're to praise him for what Jesus did. Because of his death, burial, and resurrection and our faith in him, it, God demonstrated that abundant mercy. We have a living hope. Why is that important? Look at the next few verses, you'll see. So what's the next verse? Look at verse 4. Verse 4. All right, so the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, moving into verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, man, don't we wish we knew more about that? I'll unpack what, 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 what we know from Scripture. But an inheritance. You know, a lot of us are promised earthly inheritances. But will we really get them? We don't know. It's sad to see what inheritances will do to brothers and sisters. I've seen it for, for years as a pastor. It, it, it can ruin a family, really. Earthly inheritances, we don't know what the stock market will do. We don't know what property will be worth. I mean... Families fall on hard times. Things have to be auctioned and sold away. I mean, our earthly inheritance is tainted by sin and it's corruptible. I mean, it's going to fade away. But he's talking about our inheritance in heaven. So it's incorruptible. That means it's death proof. It's undefiled. It's sin proof. And he goes on to say that it won't fade away. That's time proof. Now, what is he talking about here? As we live and walk with the Lord, I, I implored that God would bless us in that. I mean, God is the one that takes the initiative in our salvation. God is the one that reveals Jesus Christ to us, and through the Holy Spirit, we can say yes to Christ. And yet, when we serve the Lord faithfully, we know that as believers, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ one day. I was reading, and this is a side note, and I'm not saying it to, to put any honor on myself, but it's just a fact. You know, there are several crowns mentioned in the Word of God that faithful believers can receive. There's a martyr's crown. There's the crown of righteousness. But there's also the crown of joy. Have you ever heard of it? Who gets that one? Or not the crown of joy. It's, well, it could be the crown of glory. That's actually what it's called. It's in 1 Peter chapter 5. The shepherd of the flock. How is it that I've always known that but never thought about it? I'm going to tell you, that gave me a new fire to love on y'all. Not that I deserve it. Good Lord, I don't know if I'll even get it the way things are going right now. But it's an a honor for me to think that one day my Savior is going to reward me. And I believe the word elder there is more than just the pastor. There's other leaders in the church. But... We're going to be rewarded. Isn't God amazing? Think about our inheritance. Think about having eternal life. What do we know about our bodies? Remember when Jesus was in his resurrected body, he could just appear and disappear. He could go through walls without changing the molecular structure of the wall. But yet he could eat. He could cook and, and, and have a meal with his disciples. It seems as though all he had to do is think and he could be in a particular place. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a glorified body. And I've already told y'all I'm going to be able to see better than any of y'all. Because I have not been able to see good on this earth. I know everybody will have perfect vision, but I think mine's going to be just a little bit better. I don't know. That's my theory. But think about what we're going to have. The beauty of heaven. Think about being able to be in the presence of the Lord. Think about being joint heirs with Jesus. I mean, when we think about our inheritance, there's so much about it we don't know. But it's incorruptible. It's not going to fade away. God's keeping it. My earthly inheritance could be stolen or, or, or hard times could take it away. But what is being stored up? My, my giving a, cold, a cup of cold water to somebody, me loving on people, me preaching to people, me living my faith. God is keeping track of how I use my time, my talents, and he's doing the same for you. And he gives us the strength to to do the work. It's not even us. And yet he blesses us to do it. That's why God is to be praised. He goes on to say in verse 5, not only is our inheritance kept, but we are kept for our inheritance. He says, who are kept by the power of God through faith 
for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, there's two aspects here. There, there's his power that keeps us. Man, you worried about losing your salvation? Here's a verse for you. God's not going to lose you if you belong to him. But yet there's faith here. That's our aspect. I mean, we have to believe what the Word of God says. And we have to stand on it whether we see it or not. And I'm telling you, that's not always easy. But we have to come to the point that we take God at His Word. Now, here's where it begins to flip. Keep in mind what we've looked at. We're to praise God for his great mercy. He gave us Jesus. We now have that living hope because Christ took the penalty and resurrected. And when we put our faith in him, we are made right. Our sins have been forgiven. We're given eternal life. And we know that we have this inheritance that it's, it's, it, it can't corrupt. It can't be defiled. It'll never fade away. And now look at verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. Or we ought to be. But, he says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Somebody say amen. amen. Have you ever been grieved by various trials? Now keep in mind, they were being persecuted. They were being tied to posts and set on fire for garden parties. That's horrific. They were being torn apart by beasts. Can you imagine your dear brother in Christ, you're, you're having dinner with him one night, and the next night he's in Nero's garden party. That's horrible. Can you imagine the terror? And yet God gives us the ticket to be bold. God gives us the ticket to stand. How are we able to do that when we go through hard times? Let's make it to something we can relate here because we really don't understand persecution in this country. If someone says something negative to us or curses us, we think that's persecution. That's not persecution. When we start getting locked up for telling people about Jesus, and when we start getting beheaded or executed or electric chair or lethal injection or whatever they're going to do to believers... That's being persecuted. When we're not able to come and assemble together in a congregation like we are right now, and we're having to meet in secret places and have code to get there, that's being persecuted. We need to have sympathy for our brothers and sisters in other parts of the land, in the world. So what are our, our, our persecutions? Well, it may be a financial persecution. And it hurts, doesn't it? It may be a medical persecution, and it hurts, doesn't it? It may be a broken relationship persecution, and it hurts. It may be something that's happened in the church that's broken your, your heart. I'm going to tell you, there ain't no hurt like church hurt. God forgive us. You name it. What is the thing that's keeping you awake at night? What is the thing that is breaking your heart? What is the thing that's causing you to shed the most tears? You know, I had a realization the other day, and Jesus is not on the cross anymore, amen? amen? He resurrected. But the picture of a cross to us is the sacrifice. It's, it's an implement of shame and terror and, and horrible suffering. But to us, it's precious because it's what Jesus did so that he was the way, the truth, and the life. So I had this vision the other day, and I don't know what's bothering you. I mean, if it's something financial, why don't you just take it and lay it at the feet of Jesus? If it's something medical, why don't you just take it and lay it at the feet of Jesus? If, if it's something that, that where someone has hurt you, why don't you forgive them and lay it at the feet of Jesus? If it's blank, whatever it is, just take it and lay it at the foot of Jesus because God is to be praised. He loved you enough to allow you to say yes to Jesus Christ and through you saying yes to Jesus Christ you have experienced that mercy of God not giving you what you deserve and, and you experience that great love and you realize I have a living hope yes I may be going through hell and I see hell all around me but you know what it is temporary it is temporary and sometimes we just need to be reminded it's laid at the foot of Jesus. I trust him and it belongs to him. I have a living hope. So I don't have to worry 
Are you ready? Lord, are they with me? Are you ready? I don't have to worry about who ends up in the White House. I need to be praying about it fervently. I need to be asking God to send revival. And I need to do my part to vote the way my convictions are. But I don't have to worry about it. If you got a disease in your body that you can't handle, you don't have to worry about that. Sometimes people get put out with me because I'll tell them, I always say this. I'll say, yes, I have terminal cancer. God can heal me today or he can heal me when I get to glory. And almost immediately somebody will say, you've got to have faith that he'll heal you today. He ain't going to heal you today if you don't have faith. And I just want to say, well, God bless you. I believe every word you're saying. I believe every word of that. But he ain't going to heal me if it ain't his will to heal me on this earth. I don't care if I have faith to go jump off a mountain. Right? Peter said that we have trials and tribulations for a little while. What is a little while? Y'all, I done run three people out. They're going that way. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I should not have said that. But think. Don't miss what I'm about to say. God can do what God wants to do in our lives. And yes, we have to have faith. But I got to live in hope that this body one day is going to be resurrected and it's going to be made new. And I'm going to walk and talk with my Savior. And we're going to rule and reign together. And he is going to reveal things to us that we never could understand here on this earth. And it ain't going to last for a day. It ain't going to last for a week. It's going to last for eternity. I have a living hope. Maybe you're going through something really hard right now, whether it's medical, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, whether it's relational, or, 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 or whether you're doubting something that is spiritual. You need to cling to who you are in Christ and let that living hope take a hold and remember how much God loves you and what Jesus did on the cross and I promise you the problem that, that, that scripture says lasts a little while it may last to the day you draw your last breath but compared to eternity that's a drop in the bucket that's right. so you just keep praising God and when the devil tells you that the storm is going to overtake you you may just need to whisper well God's arms are waiting for me. If this storm takes me out, God's waiting for me. If the storm don't take me out, I'm going to keep serving and praising Him until He, until he does take me out. Because we're going to be taken out, either by rapture or by death. Okay. I love you, Miss Catherine. Where's my Bible? <laughs> I almost had a panic attack. <laughs> is he leaving? Kenny? Let's pray. Kenny is not doing well right now. Let's pray for him. Thank you, Miss Catherine. Father, we lift our brother Kenny up as he's on his way to the hospital with some chest pains. Father, we just pray all will be well. Lord, just be with Miss Catherine as she goes with him. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Miss Catherine. We're praying. All right. Look at verse 7 and 8 and 9, and let's, let's land the plane. That the, this is the purpose of the trials. That the genuineness of your faith, having much, being much more present, precious than gold, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found praise, honor, and glory at the, re at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gold is purified by fire. The impurities come to the top, they're skimmed off, and you have a purer form of gold. But yet gold will perish. It takes a lot of pressure and a lot of heat, but it will. Peter is reminding us 
that the pressures of life, all the things that I just mentioned that cause us heartache and headache, but we keep our mind on the living hope, all of those things are to purify us. Amen. I've been living it for, for three years. And it ain't over yet. God wants to do something really big with my character. Because it seems like with every month, it's another brick I'm carrying. And he's carrying. Because I am yoked to Christ. I don't shed a tear that he's not crying with me. Every pound that I carry, he's carrying the brunt of it. Do you ever realize that we always want to pray, God, let it get away from me. Why is this happening? Take it away, Lord. And God is like, I'm doing something in your life that you can't imagine. When I get through with you, you're going to love me more, you're going to worship me more, and you're going to serve me better. And those around you are going to be better for going through it with you because we never go through anything alone. Our family and friends go with us. Look at verse 8 and verse 9. Whom having not seen, you love. Now, remember, Peter had saw Jesus, but most of the people he's talking to, they had never seen him. So he says, Whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The, the, this word here for inexpressible, this is the only time it is used in the Word of God. And it means that it is something that is so magnificent, that is so spectacular, that is so awesome that it cannot even be expressed. Now, I want you to put it all together because it's where we began, inexpressible joy. When we think about how much God loves us and all of our brokenness and what Jesus did on the cross for us, man, that abundant mercy, we've got a living hope. It ain't a dead hope. It's a hope that knows that God is going to resurrect us one day, that we're going to spend eternity with him, that we will never go through a battle as a believer that Christ is not with us. And man, when we think about the inheritance and then we think about all the trials that we go through, we can endure the trials because we know God is with us through the trial. He's going to get us out of the trial one day, and we're going to spend eternity with Him. Amen. That's how come we have joy inexpressible and full of glory. Yeah. Because cancer doesn't define us. Mental illness doesn't define us. Brokenness does not define us. Amen. Amen. Joy inexpressible. What are you going through today? It hurts, doesn't it? You got a child that's sick? That's a whole new level of hurt. Maybe you're sick. We turn on the news. We look at how broken our leadership is. It seems like everything that's right is not just twisted now. It's, it's swung to the polar opposite can be discouraging, can it? We look at what's happening in a lot of our churches and it breaks our hearts. In our own denomination, it seems like people are not God-centered anymore. They're self-centered. But you know what? We have a living hope. Our hope is that Christ will never leave and forsake us that he will walk through us through every storm of life. And one day, which is going to be in a little while, we'll spend eternity with him. You know, our salvation's in three tenses, past, present, and future. This is not new. I've said it a hundred times. The day you said yes to Jesus Christ is the day you were saved from the penalty of sin. Every single day, we're saved from the power of sin if we keep our eyes on Christ. And praise God, our living hope is when we get to our inheritance, our forever home with Jesus Christ, in the future, we're going to be saved from the presence of sin. Amen? Amen. So what decision do you need to make today? I don't know. Maybe you're an older person, a middle-aged person, or a younger person. You're probably a good person because I, I, I can't think of anybody in here that's not a good person but do you know, not 90%, not 99%, do you know 
100% that you have asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Do you know that? And you say, well, I, you, I, I, how can you know that? <laughs> if you've admitted you're a sinner and know Jesus is God's Son and died and rose for you and asked Him to come in, and you believe that in your heart, you may flounder from season to season, but you know. If you don't know that, I'm telling you, you don't want to stand before God not knowing. Because if you are not saved, there is no second chance. And eternity is long. We're not talking about you'll be paroled in 10 years or 100 years or a million years or a billion years. You don't work your way out of hell. When you're there, you're there forever. That ought to make us cringe. And it ought to make us praise God if we know Jesus. If you're a follower of Christ, have you given him your all? He's your living hope. He'll get you through the trials of life. And you know what? We talk about all the glory in heaven, glorified bodies, no more sin. I'm going to tell you what. It is a joy to know Christ right now. Praise God for what is coming. But my living hope is present right now. I could not make it through my life right now if I didn't know who Christ was. Maybe you just need prayer this morning. Maybe some of you have given your heart to Christ. But there's another decision God wants you to make. Would you do what God tells you to do? I've done my part. I've done my part this morning. The Holy Spirit has to touch your heart. And you've got to be obedient. Father, as we come to our time of, edu- uh, time of education, it's been that. Our time of invitation. Lord, help me. I've done my best, Lord, to explain this passage. As Brother Ed comes and, and our musicians, Lord, prepare our hearts for this. This is the most important part of the service. Lord, with no distractions, Lord, let people hear your voice and be obedient. Lord, we give you the honor and the praise, and I pray for the one today that's teetering on. Do I make the decision or not? Please let them do what you're whispering in their ear to do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.